There's, oh. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Ben Selby. I am 10 years old, and I'm in the fifth grade at Eaton Elementary. I, I am so glad to be here this morning to welcome you to Children's Sabbath. First of all, I wanted to start our morning off with a joke or two. Did you, did you know I was a comedian? Well, I am, and maybe even better than Pastor David. <laughs> Just kidding, Pastor David. See, I already made you laugh. <laughs> what type of car would Jesus have driven? A Chrysler. <laughs> what animal could Noah not trust? And uh, the cheetah. <laughs> Okay, now for the announcements. There will be a free shred event this Wednesday from 8 to 11 a.m. here at the church. Bring all your paper documents to be disposed of in a safe way. Our next stars, seniors talking and remembering the seasons, luncheon is also this Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Sign up on, sign up on the Deep Roots Bulletin Board. Lastly, the Stern Not Shrinking Adult Social for the Fridays to 50s Club, my mom and dad's age, will be Thursday, May 18th. The RSVP deadline is this Thursday, so please see the bulletin intern on how to RSVP. Don't forget to book those sitters. That's all I have today. Enjoy the service, and thank you.
please stand and join us in the call to worship. This is the day found in your bulletin. Opening him is this day. This is the day. This is the day. This that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice. And be glad in it. And be glad in it. This, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day. That the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. Please join us in singing the opening hymn found on page 600 in your hymnal. standing. Please join me in saying the children's affirmation of faith found in your bulletin. We believe in God who loves us and wants us to love each other. This is our God. We believe in Jesus who cared about children and held them in his arms. He wanted a world where everyone could live together in peace. This is Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit who keeps working with us until everything is good and true. This is the Holy Spirit. We can be the church who reminds people of God because we love each other. This we believe. Amen. Good morning. We hope you are enjoying Children's Sabbath so far. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Now, please turn to your neighbor and pass the peace of Christ.
Hi, today I'll be reading Psalm chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torts of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Singing a song for you based on the verse Luke 6:31, which says, "Do to others as you would have them do to you." We know this as our golden rule. Enjoy the anthem. Please bow your heads and join me in the morning prayer. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and for our beautiful church family. Thank you for giving us comfortable homes, plenty of good food to eat, and water to drink. We pray that you help us to take good care of the earth which you have given us. We also pray for the leaders of our community and world that they will make decisions that honor and take care of your gifts to us. We pray for those on our prayer list and for those we lift up now in our hearts. These things we ask in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. This is one of my favorite books, The Cat in the Hat. Who knows who the main character is? The cat in the hat. <laughs> <laughs> who is it, Ben? The main character is the two little kids. They're on the first page. <laughs> okay. <laughs> who are some of the other characters? The kids. <laughs> and and the things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How do you know the cat in the hat is the main character? Uh, you can't answer. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's in the title. Okay. Yeah. 
back. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> on all the pages on the book? <laughs> not all of them. You get shown the most often. Yeah. You got almost every page, right? Who knows what this is? A Bible. A Bible. Yes. Who knows? Oh. Who knows some of the main characters of the? Who is the main character of the Bible? Um, close. Well, that's God. Oh, you can't answer that. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, God. What an answer! The Bible mentions a lot of people, but none of those people, not even Jesus, gets as much attention as the main character. The main character of the Bible is God. The Bible tells us how God made the world, how he led the people of Israel, how he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, how he sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts to teach us, and how he's going to make a special place for us in heaven. The story of the Bible is all about God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us the story about you. Help us to spend time reading it this week so that we can get to know more about you. Amen. Amen. I think everybody's getting a piece of candy before they head back to their seats. <laughs> I want to thank all of the children for leading us in worship throughout the day today. The music's been great. The readings have been great. Thank you all for your leadership. It's been, it's been fabulous. Um, but I've got to admit, there have been a couple of times in the last few minutes where I've really been humbled. Um, one was in having a child lead me in prayer. Um, I don't experience that all that much other than uh, perhaps at the dinner table when one of my children uh, leads us in, uh, in grace. Um, a second was when, just now, when uh, these uh, kids taught us um, about the Bible and who the, the main character is in the Bible. Um, and a third time was in the reading of the Bible when uh, Luke Johnson came up and read from Psalm 18. And that psalm took on a whole different meaning for me to hear a child talk about um, crying out in distress to God. Um, I've always heard that in an adult voice, and it just completely changes the scripture to hear it in a child's voice and, um, and to think about you know, what um, our children might be going through in their lives. So I just want to thank you all for giving us a, a really new perspective in worship today. It's been fantastic. Um, so my name's Doug Lane. I'm a senior pastor here at Wrights William C., and I'm glad to be able to uh, present uh, the message today. I was out last week. Several of you noticed that. And I thought I'd take a moment uh, maybe to connect with the kids that are here as to the reason why I was not here last week. I was at Taylor Swift. Um, I saw her in Atlanta last week with my family. We had a great, great time. And the reason Pastor Julia is not here today is because she's at the Taylor Swift concert in Nashville. So I understand Taylor Swift's going to be in Philly next week. Pastor David, will you be here, or are you going to be at Taylor Swift? Okay, well, we appreciate your commitment. Thank you. Uh, well done. Um, our scripture for today comes uh, from the gospel. Oh, somewhat. I'm sorry. Are, he's going to read it for me? Oh, I don't want to skip over his spot. Okay, pardon me. Thank you. scripture lesson for today is from Mark um, chapter 10, 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the children come, let the little children come to me and do not do not these. I, I tell you, anyone who not, will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. The word of 
God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Abe. I'm sorry to have stepped over your, uh, your part. You did a great job in, in reading our gospel uh, message from the Gospel of Mark. Let's uh, pray together. <coughs> Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you for um, all of these children who have led us today. And Lord, I pray that we might open our hearts and minds to the needs of children around us, um, not just in our homes, but in our community and around the world. Lord, all of us are your children, um, just in different age and experience, and Lord, I pray that um, you will open our hearts and our minds um, so that we might uh, hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, there's a famous scene in the movie Pretty Woman where Julia Roberts' character goes clothes shopping on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Anybody seen this movie? Almost everybody. Okay. If you've never seen the movie, it's a modern retelling of the Cinderella story, but that does not make it appropriate for young children, okay? And if you have seen the movie, then you know the scene that I'm talking about. Vivian, played by Roberts, has been given plenty of money to spend on new clothes, but the sales clerks at the upscale clothing store take one look at her wild hair and her shabby dress, and they refuse to help her. So Vivian goes back to the hotel where she's staying, and she cries to the manager that she's supposed to buy a pretty dress for an upcoming dinner, and she has all this money, but no one will help her. The nice hotel manager then makes arrangements for her to go shopping at the store of a friend, and she gets what she needs there. Uh, then, with her new dress on and her hair pulled back and a fancy hat and fancy shoes and bags and bags of more clothes, she goes back to the first shop and tells the clerk that ignored her, Hi, do you remember me? I was in here yesterday. You wouldn't wait on me. You work on commission, right? What does she say next? Big, Big mistake. Big. Huge. And as she leaves, she says, I have to go shopping now. <laughs> Obviously, Vivian was making the point that the clerks at the upscale shop should have taken her more seriously. Christ's disciples were about to do the same thing on their way to Jerusalem. No, they weren't about to miss out on a huge commission, but they were about to ignore some really important people. Busy, pushed, stressed out about so many truly urgent things, they were suddenly intruded upon by some mothers who requested that their children get to meet Jesus. Children, the disciples answered. We don't have time for children. There are sick folks to heal and lessons to teach and Pharisees to challenge and temples to cleanse and thrones to establish. Don't bother the teacher with children. And as the rejected mothers were about to turn away, Jesus realizes all that's taken place. And the author Mark says, when Jesus saw what happened, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And then he took them in his arms and bless them. The disciples almost turned away the very ones whom Jesus called closest to the kingdom of God. It impresses me on reading this story that Jesus took time to laugh, hug, and play with little kids. We could have included this scene in our Lenten sermon series for he was on his way to Jerusalem. He was embarking upon the final episode of his mortal life. He was on his way to the cross. And one would think, with all of that looming before him, that he would not have had time for children. But there was something about children that was close to the heart of Jesus. There's something about children that ordinarily gets close to the hearts of all who follow him. Now, we clergy, we usually do our best to steer clear of cliches. They're weary, they're worn, our congregations have heard them all already, 
And a lot of them are actually directly opposed to Scripture. So it's best to avoid them when we can. However, when the topic at hand is children, there's no getting around the use of cliches because one by one, they can be true. Like, children really are our most precious natural resource. You've heard that. Or the children are our future. Or better yet, children aren't the future, they're the present. Well, according to the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina, more than 12,000 children in New Hanover County are food insecure. 12,000 in our county. I spoke with a social worker from New Hanover High School to prepare for this sermon, and she told me that district-wide we have more than 1,000 children right here in our county who do not have permanent housing. 1,000! Now, that doesn't mean that they're sleeping under a bridge, but it's often the case that they're sleeping on someone's couch because they don't have a home of their own. The Center for Homeland Defense and Security keeps a record of school shootings. When I graduated high school in 1989, there were 19 school shootings in America, which is 19 too many. When my daughter graduated high school last year, there were 302 including one that she witnessed from just 15 feet away. Suicide's now the second leading cause of death for teenagers in America. Dennis Campbell, the former dean of Duke Divinity School, is unquestionably accurate in his assessment that we are guilty of giving our children too much to live with and not enough to live for. Our most precious natural resource. And yet, look what's happening to them. Maybe those things aren't happening in your home, but does it happen to anyone we know? The school shooting at New Hanover did. Your kids and grandkids probably have a bed to sleep in and plenty of food to eat at night, but that's not necessarily the case for their classmates. Children need and deserve the very best we have to offer in protection, nurture, education, role modeling, in the allotment of our time, in the sharing of our faith, and in the generous provision of our love. Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them. There's something about children that's close to the heart of the Savior and should be close to the heart of all of us. But another important consideration not to miss this day is that not only do children need us, but that we need them. There is a tremendous amount that we mature, sophisticated adults can and should learn from kids. The disciples thought they knew all about God and God's will and God's love, but Jesus told them, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child shall not enter it. Or as another translation phrases it, except you believe with the faith of a child, you shall have no part in the kingdom of God. In other words, said Jesus, no matter how skilled or erudite these disciples considered themselves, the children are closer to the truth than we are. They still had a lot to learn from children. And that's not really changed that much from Jesus' day to ours. For example, we learn about trust from children. There is not one ounce of doubt in a child's mind that mommy has magical special powers and really can kiss that hurt and make it all go away. That's trust that transcends logic, absolute confidence in the protective power and unfailing love of a parent. Jesus said that God is enabled to do far more with our lives if we experience the same sort of trust than we could ever lean on ourselves. Doubt. It builds barriers, but trust in God opens doors. Except you believe with the faith of a child, he said, you will limit what God can do with your life. Except you trust with the faith of a child. Children also teach us a great deal about faith as well. A pastor friend of mine posted that during her very hectic Holy Week, her platter was extraordinarily full with church activities. There was a Monday Thursday service to plan, a Good Friday community service the very next day, a sunrise service, and most of all, 
there was a challenge of getting ready for Easter Sunday with multiple worship services that'd be followed immediately with a family trip to the grandparents. All throughout the week, she kept on talking about Easter plans and Easter services and Easter this and Easter that. And then one evening at dinner, it was her five-year-old's turn to say grace. And at the end of his God is great, God is good prayer, he added the words, and Lord, I sure hope Jesus is feeling better. Well, she asked her husband what in the world he was talking about. He didn't know. So she asked her son. And he told her that his Sunday school teacher had been telling them about the cross and how Jesus suffered there for all of us. So we prayed, aware of the suffering of Christ, while she, this theologically trained pastor, during Holy Week had mentally jumped right past the suffering and was concerned only with preparing for the victory of celebration which is what a lot of us do, don't we? Children teach us great lessons about faith, especially, I suspect, because they get to the heart of the matter. Children, more than anyone else, seem to understand intuitively that at the heart of Christianity is Jesus himself, his life, his death, and his relationship with us. Additionally, children share powerful secrets about how we're meant to deal with one another. For instance, I grew up in an all-white neighborhood. And like many of you, I went to an intentionally integrated school due to carefully drawn district maps and busing. I remember my elementary school days back in the 70s. Everyone played with everyone else on the playground. When it was time to play Red Rover, which is too dangerous to play nowadays, you didn't care if the people you were playing with were African American, Asian American, Hispanic, white, or Native American. And when you played dodgeball, which is also considered too dangerous to play in the 21st century, we didn't care what color you were, we just played. And when you got on top of one of those big geodesic dome jungle gyms that no longer exist because they are also too dangerous nowadays, you just had fun. We were kids. We didn't realize the color of one's skin made any difference. We thought people were neat just because they were people. We were just children. And as such, we were colorblind. Children almost always are, unless they're taught differently. Maybe there's a lesson there for us sophisticated <laughs> grown-ups. A lesson about who is or who is not worthy of our kindness and our care. Maybe children know better than anyone else that it's not the color of their skin or their gender or the size of one's home or one's political affiliation or the kind of car that one drives that makes a person worthy and special. Children seem to understand that everyone is worthy just because God made them. And that's enough. Let the children come to me, he said. Do not hinder them, for to such as these belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom as a child shall not enter it. Years ago, I ran across the following poem, and I tried over the week to figure out who was the author as I was looking for this poem again. And I, I don't know who it is, but whoever the author may have been obviously comprehended the Christ-likeness of children. The author understood that to be like Jesus, we must somehow become like children again. Here's how it goes. The poem reads, There's something quite nice about children. Every family should have one or two. They're such a fine race when they're kept in their place. Say the playground, the park, or the zoo. In his place, a child's quite delightful, full of fun, a most interesting buddy, but his yearning for action can cause a distraction when he has invaded the study. The office is no place for children. They foul up our work with their fun, so we make it a rule that they must go to school so their elders can get something done. Some children came searching for Jesus. His friends were distressed and inclined to think, oh, how terrible to have a fresh parable suddenly slip from his mind. So they tried to get rid of the children, 
surely no major disgrace, protecting their master from certain disaster by keeping the children in place. Let the children come in, shouted Jesus, then said something frightfully odd. They are bearers of grace, and their ultimate place is right smack in the kingdom of God. Well, the place of a child is the kingdom. That's what Jesus carefully taught. So the last time you did play some ball with your kid, you were closer to God than you thought. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Most holy and loving God, we thank you for the ways that children teach us. Lord, I pray that we would continue to learn from kids about faith and trust and loving one another, and most especially about loving you. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is uh, number 601. It's Thy Word is a Lamp. Let's stand and sing it together. kids a big hand today. I think sending us out will be some of our fifth graders who are going to be moving on from Children of Joy into um, 412 Youth Group next year. So uh, um, we, uh, we look forward to, um, to hearing you as, as you dismiss us today. But for our benediction, I just want us to remember what it's like to be a child. And to have that faith and trust in, in something greater than ourselves. That maybe we might be that kind of innocent people that experience God's love in our own lives. And are willing to just willy-nilly share that grace with others. Go forth in peace knowing that you too are God's children.